A, ch a Lesson Before Dying, Chapter 11. The sheriff was in his office when I came into the courthouse. I could see him behind his desk talking to another man who had just opened the door to leave. They talked a while longer. Then the man came out into the corridor. I caught the door and went into the office with the bag of food. Help you? Gidry asked me. He sat with his cowboy boots propped up on the desk. He wore an open collar, light gray shirt, and dark gray pants. His necktie, his cowboy hat, and his coat hung on a rack by the file cabinet next to his desk. This was the first time he had been in his office since I started up coming up here. But I didn't doubt that he knew who I was. I came to see Jefferson, I said. How are y'all getting along? This will be my first time alone with him. What's in the basket? Food is Nan and Sins. Paul, Gidry called, while still looking at me. The young deputy came into the office from a side door. Called, Sheriff? Gidry nodded towards me. How you doing, the deputy asked. Fine, and yourself? I can't complain, he said. We went through the usual routine. I had to take everything out of my pockets and put it all back. The deputy went through all the food, unwrapping one piece of chicken, checking it, putting it back. He unwrapped two or three pieces of candy, checked out the bag of sweet potatoes. Then, finished, he wiped his hands on a pocket handkerchief. Still think you can get something into that head of his? Gidry spoke across the tips of those cowboy boots. I don't know, sir. Just remember what I said, Gidry said. Any sign of aggravation, I'll stop all this. I nodded my head. Then I remembered that I had to speak out. Yes, sir. He looked at me a while. Then he nodded to the deputy and we left the office. Since Miss Emma was not with us this time, I walked beside the deputy instead of behind him. We went by all the familiar open doors where people pecked on typewriters. We climbed up familiar stairs up to the big steel door that led into the cell block. By now, I could probably have done this with my eyes shut. The prisoners came to the cell doors before, but they were if they were not the same ones, they were the same ages, in their late teens or early twenties. I gave them the change I had. Nobody got more than a dime. Two could put their money together and get a pack of cigarettes, or one could get a pack of gum and a candy bar. Jefferson sat on his bunk with his head bowed and his arms hanging down between his legs. The deputy opened the door for me to go in, and he reminded me that he would be back within the hour. In case I wanted to leave before then, I could call a trustee, and the trustee would come to get him. Jefferson, I said. He didn't look up. Your nana couldn't make it today, I said. She has a bad cold, but she sent you something. How are you feeling, Jefferson? After a while, he raised his head, but he didn't look at me. He looked at the barred window. From the cell, all you could see were the yellow leaves on the sycamore tree and the pale blue sky between the leaves. You hungry, I asked. You brought some corn, he said. Corn? That's what hogs eat, he said turning his head now to look at me. He had not washed his face or combed his hair for days. He wore one of my old khaki shirts and a wrinkled pair of brown pants. He didn't have on shoes. They were stuck under the bunk. I didn't bring any corn, I said, and you're not a hog. He looked at me as if I was patronizing him. When was the last time you ate, I asked him. I don't know. Today, I asked him. I don't know. He was playing with me, and I knew it. Some chicken in there, I said. Biscuits and sweet potatoes, even some candy she made. You ought to try it. It'll make her happy. Hogs don't eat no candy, he said. You're not a hog, I said. You're a man. He grunted deep in his throat and grinned at me. Mind if I have a piece of your chicken, I asked him. I left before dinner. He acted as though he had not heard me. Since the deputy had already gone through the paper bag, I didn't have to do too much unwrapping to get to the food. I took out a drumstick and a biscuit and started eating. 
Your Nana sure can cook, I said. That's for humans, he said. You're a human being, Jefferson, I said. I'm an old hog, he said. Humans don't stay in no stall like this. I'm an old hog they fattening up to kill. That would hurt your Nana if she heard you say that. You want me to tell her you said that? Old hog don't care what people say. She cares, I said. And I do too, Jefferson. Y'all humans, he said. You're a human being too, Jefferson. I'm an old hog, he said, more to himself than to me. Just the old hog they fattening up to kill for Christmas. You're a human being, Jefferson. You're a man. He kept his eyes on me as he got up from the bunk. I'm going to show you how an old hog eat, he said. He knelt down on the floor and put his head inside the bag and started eating without using his hands. He even sounded like a hog. I stood back watching him while I continued to eat the biscuit and piece of chicken. That's how a old, old hog eat, he said, raising his head and grinning at me. He got up from his knees and went back to his bunk. That's how a old hog eat. That's how an old hog eat. All right, I said. But when I go back, I'm going to tell her that you and I sat on the bunk and ate, and you said how good the food was. I won't tell her what you did. She's already sick, and that would kill her. So I'm going to lie. I'm going to tell her how much you like the food, especially the pralines. He said nothing. He just grinned at me. Are you trying to hurt me, Jefferson? I asked him. Are you trying to make me feel guilty for your being here? You don't want me to come back here anymore? His expression didn't change, as though someone had chiseled that painful, cynical grin on his face. That man out there doesn't want me up here either, I told him. He said, I will never be able to make you understand anything. He said, I'm just wasting my time coming up here now. But your Nanan doesn't think so. She wants me to come up here. She wants us to talk. What do you want? You want me to stay away and let him win? The white man? You want him to win? His expression remained the same. Cynical, defiant, painful. I could not think of anything else to say to him. But since I had been there less than half an hour, I knew it was too early to call for the deputy. The sheriff would have known that Jefferson and I were not getting along, and that was the last thing I could afford, at least for Miss Emma's sake. The rest of the hour just dragged along. Jefferson was not looking at me anymore. He had lain back down on the bunk, facing the wall. I gazed out the window at the yellow leaves on the sycamore tree. The leaves were as still as if they were painted there. Between the leaves, I could see bits of pale blue sky. I looked at Jefferson with his back to me. I looked at his pair of laceless shoes under the bunk. I looked down at the bag of food, trying to remember how many pieces of chicken, biscuits, potatoes, or pieces of candy were still in there. I went to the wash bowl and got a handful of water to drink. I tried turning off the faucet off completely, but it continued to drip. The water had left a brown stain from the top of the bowl to the drain. I turned to Jefferson again. He was facing the wall, his back to me. I wanted to ask him what he was thinking about. When I heard the deputy come down to the cell block, I went to the bunk. Anything you want me to tell your nana? I asked him. He didn't answer. His eyes were open and staring at the wall. I'll tell her how much you enjoyed the food, I said. That would make her happy. The deputy came up to the cell and let me out. Y'all doing all right, he asked as we walked away. He was glad to get some home cooking, I said. I can't blame him for that, the deputy said.